Hi, welcome to another exciting episode of Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith, and our program is sponsored by the Associates for Biblical Research. On our show, we talk very much about archaeological discoveries that illuminate and show the reliability of the scriptures. Today, I have a very special guest joining us, all the way from Amman, Jordan, Mr. Joel Kramer from SourceFlix Ministries. Joel, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's great to have you on the program all the way from a, you know, a, a third of the way around the world. Uh, we've, you've been friends with the ABR ministry for a long time, and uh, we're going to talk yes. about uh, the exciting world of archaeology. We're going to get to a particular artifact that we want to share with the audience. That's awesome. But before we do that, I'd like you to introduce yourself a little bit to the audience, tell them about what you do, uh, why it's important the calling on your life and your family's life. Uh, as you're there over in the uh, the Holy Land, the extended Holy Land in Jordan. Uh, yeah, I've uh, I've lived in the Middle East for 25 years. Actually, I grew up in uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, I lived there for 13 years. Lived in Israel for uh, 10 years, and then uh, have lived in Jordan for two years. And so uh, many years ago, uh, living in Israel, I did a film with uh, Dr. Bryant Wood, and we got to be good friends, and yes. he's the one that inspired me also to go on to study archaeology. So I went and uh, studied archaeology in Jerusalem and got a master's degree in archaeology. Yeah, that's that's tremendous. And now if I recall, that sort of happened in the providence of God. You, if I re remember right, you didn't go to Israel to get an archaeology degree. Is that right? But that's, no. that's kind no. of what happened, right? It's, exactly. It's yeah. Very, very fascinating. Yeah the direction that God leads our lives. But now that you have this degree, you learned by living in Israel, you learned a great deal about what the archaeologists say, what the evidence is, and so on. Yeah, I spent uh, almost 10 years uh, studying archaeology there and uh, being active in many different digs. And, uh, and so, yeah, I got quite, quite familiar with it and, and continue to to do work in archaeology as well. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. Well, so we can call you an archaeologist. You didn't intend to go to Israel to become one, but you are an archaeologist. And uh, we're excited to have you here, Joel. It's really, it's really great to have you on the show. Now, um, we decided uh, we could talk about thousands of different artifacts. I mean, there's, there's so much to talk about as it relates to the Bible. You mentioned Jericho. That's another whole subject in and of itself. Um, but we're going to talk about this inscription uh, in the Sudan. It's one inscription. We've talked about it on our show briefly before, but you're going to really share with us today the importance of this description. I'll let you set the stage for the audience of what it is, uh, sort of, let's set that up a little bit. So go ahead. Well, there's actually uh, two inscriptions that are, um, that are very significant. They're both located in the country of Sudan. Um, in ancient times, that was part of Egypt. And, uh, and one of them was found first in a site called Amara West when they were excavating a temple built by uh, Ramses II. And, uh, and he listed out his foreign enemies, and one of those was uh, an inscription that translates the nomads of Yahweh. And then uh, that was in the late 30s. Then later in the, 19, the late 50s, uh, they excavated another site not too far away from uh, Amara West, called Solab, and they were excavating there, and they found a, a list of uh, foreign enemies to the pharaoh Amenhotep III, and, uh, and one of his enemies also was uh, translated the nomads of Yahweh. And so this Solab inscription, there's, and, and I want to emphasize this, there are many inscriptions that have been found through archaeology that mention the name of the god of Israel, Yahweh. Yes. But this Solab inscription is very important because it is the oldest inscription that has been found to date mentioning the name of, of uh, the God of Israel. So the area of the, of the modern, of modern Sudan was under control of the, of the ancient pharaohs. And so this yes. inscription was found in the, in the 1930s. When, when they started deciphering it back then, the archaeologists, what, did, did they recognize the importance of it, Joel? And uh, what, what kind of... Uh, response was there back then or or was it tepid well yeah th there was uh it, it was understood to be very important mentioning the name of the god of israel however 
there was there never has really been a controversy on what these inscriptions say um, that they that they mention the name Yahweh has you know in all of the translations that have been done they agree that's what it says yeah. uh, where the controversy has been is uh, is scholars have been reluctant to attribute who the nomads of Yahweh are in yeah. regards to them being Israel. So, you know, these are the Kenites and these are the Edomites. These are anybody but the Israelites, which is really ridiculous because uh, in the Old Testament, of course, the name Yahweh appears 6,823 times. And so maybe, <laughs> maybe that's the nomads of Yahweh. And the reason, the reason why they are reluctant to do that is because it throws a monkey wrench in uh, many theories that are out there. Yeah, about the about the development of Israel, where they came from, and and exactly. those and those kinds of things. Now let's talk about the date real briefly. Um, as we we set up, we got about a minute and a half here. Just to, let's talk about a, a the date and the sort of context of, of that, and then we'll build on that in our next segment. Okay, so so the inscription itself uh, dates to uh, the fifteenth end of the fifteenth century B.C. And of course, you know, give or take. 10, 20 years based on how Egyptian chronology kind of shifts back and forth, but generally to the end of the 15th century BC, to the time of Amenhotep III. And, um, and so, and it's, it's, uh, it's one of his northern enemies. So we also know, you know, that it's an enemy somewhere to the north of Egypt. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's very early. We're talking about the same half century that Moses lived in. We're not talking long after the death of Moses that Amenhotep III put this foreign enemy inscription on his temple. Excellent. So we see a recognition by a foreign power of this particular group of people. And we'll talk more about the significance of the Bedouin, right? They call them the Bedouin or the nomads, right? Uh, next segment, we'll talk more about that. Well, why is that important? But here we have this recognition by this foreign power and we find it again of, of the Israelite God. It's so amazing. It's in the Moabite stone too, which we've talked about on this program numerous times, the name yes. Yahweh and in other, in other uh, inscriptions as well. Absolutely. There's a whole string of, uh, of inscriptions mentioning the name Yahweh. The Solab inscription is the oldest. Yeah, that's, that's really tremendous. Okay, folks, so uh, if, please stick around for uh, our next segment. We're going to build on what we've been talking about here with Joel uh, joining us from SourceFlix Ministries all the way from Amman, Jordan, and we'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archeological field work and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures for students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm joined today by Mr. Joel Kramer, joining us by Skype all the way from Amman, Jordan. And today we're talking about a very important inscription called the Soleb inscription, which mentions the name of Yahweh, and particularly people who worship him, the nomads of Yahweh. And uh, Joel was sharing in our first segment a little bit of information about this inscription it's found in the Sudan. It's dated to uh, the period around the time of the Exodus. So, Joel, uh, let's, let's build a little bit. Sometimes... Um, we as the church, when we're doing this kind of scholarship, sometimes we can be accused of uh, fudging the information or trying to, you know, make it into apologetics. You know, we're just trying to defend the faith and justify the Christian faith. Uh, but you have a great quote from a secular scholar that I'd like you to share with the audience about this inscription. Go ahead with that. Yeah, this is uh, from Donald Redford. This is how I learned about this inscription. I was reading his book, uh, Egypt, Canaan, and Israel in Ancient Times. And I came across this quote. He says this, talking again about this soul of inscription. He says, for half a century, it has been generally admitted that we have here the Tetragrammaton. 
the name of the Israelite God, Yahweh. And if this be the case, and listen to what he says here, as it undoubtedly is, yeah. the passage constitutes a most precious indication of the whereabouts. Now, here's the date of the inscription. During the late 15th century B.C. of the enclave, uh, revering this God. And so I think it is important to emphasize that this is this is an agreed upon inscription, this find, and the translation of it is not controversial. It's not me and you saying this is what this inscription says. This is what uh, secular scholarship, how it's translated through secular scholarship. This is the date assigned to it from secular scholarship, the end of the 15th century BC, which by the way is the biblical date for the conquest. Yeah, in, in, in a previous set of episodes with Dr. Stripling, we've had roundtable discussions about the date of the Exodus, and uh, those have been uh, been aired, and people can draw upon those to see how we've made that argument, and this inscription fits well with that. Now, it's interesting. I, I was thinking, um, I guess twofold, maybe you could explain how the secular scholars try to sort of ex- explain this away, not the fact that it says Yahweh, but what their explanation is. And then if you could talk about, well, this idea of these nomads, how that fits the Bible, like just expand on that a little bit. Sure. Go ahead, please. Yeah. uh, I mean, the way that secular scholarship does not believe that in the end of the 15th century BC, that the Israelites existed. And so, right. uh, and they, of course, believe that the Bible was uh, written much later. And so, if the Bible was written later, then why do we have this group of nomads uh, worshiping Yahweh running around in the late 15th century? It's, yeah. it's a real problem. And, yeah. uh, and so, what they do is they say, well, this isn't talking about the Israelites. This is talking about the Kenites or the Edomites. And then later, when Israel comes into existence, then they get, they borrow the the name of their God, Yahweh. Well, of course, if you have the biblical people that are in the Bible, the Edomites and the Kenites around in the 15th century, then why not the Israelites, who the Bible also says are around in the 15th century? So it just doesn't work. Their, their arguments don't work, and they're just trying to cling to these old theories that really fall apart with evidence like this, such as the documentary hypothesis and the, these kinds of theories. And uh, it's also a problem, as you brought up, for those who believe in uh, a late date for the conquest in the mid uh, 13th century right. BC, because if you if you have uh, the conquest happening in, say, 1250 or 1230 BC, then again, why do we have this group of nomads who are worshiping Yahweh, like the Bible says, running around in the end of the 15th century BC? And, and yes, this uh, this word that uh, is translated from Egyptian uh, as nomads is, is shazu, which is uh, which means nomads. It's it's people, as you said, like the Bedouin that we see today running around. And uh, and so what if you think about Amenhotep the Third, who is identifying his enemies, and he has to identify uh, the Israelites whom we're reading about in the Book of Exodus at this time. Uh, what better way to describe them, identify them? You can't identify them as a nation. They're not a nation yet. You can't right. identify them as a city. They don't live in cities. They're nomads. So how does he identify them? He identifies them by the name of the God that they worship. And what better way to describe the people we're reading about in the Bible who are wandering around in the wilderness, <laughs> yeah. following a, a, a pillar of fire by night and, and a cloud by day, who are following their God Yahweh? Uh, it's it's perfect, and w- there is no evidence. There is no inscriptions. There's no evidence at all that the Edomites, or the Kenites, or I- anybody else worshipped the God Yahweh. Maybe individuals did, but as far as nations go, right. Whereas, even as the quote that we just read says, this this name that's found is the name of the God of Israel. Uh, yeah, it, it 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 fits so well. It's almost too good to be true. You know, you know what I mean. Maybe, you know, that's part exactly. of the problem. I think the secular scholars have now. They're influenced by these other models. You mentioned the documentary hypothesis. I'll I'll mention to our audience real quick. This is the idea that these the biblical texts have been written centuries after the events they record. So, and of course, we would always argue. Well, how did they get all this stuff right if they wrote it centuries later? There's no way they could do that. 
And so these yeah. these these um, uh, discoveries really refute this old theory that just won't die. It just will it will not die in biblical scholarship. Yeah. So I add that thought. The other the other part of it is is uh, the other name ring that's there uh, mentions Ashkelon, and it shows you the difference between that. Right? It's naming a place, a city. Right. Just talk about that a little bit in contrast to the uh, the nomad idea. You got about forty five seconds. Yeah, they, they, uh, if, if your enemy is a city-state, then it's easy to identify them just by giving the name of the city. But again, with nomads who are moving around in tents and don't live anywhere in particular, then uh, how are you going to identify them? And, uh, and, and so the best way to identify them, and actually the way that they are identified both by Ramses II in this other inscription in Amara West, and in the Solab inscription by Amenhotep III, is to identify them by a more important name than the name Israel, by the name that they uh, of the God that they worship, which the name of the God that they worship is their identity. Yes, and that's why that's why Moses asks God for His name. If you're going to make us your people and free us from our slavery then what's your name? Because your name will be our identity. Yeah, that, that's, that's really tremendous. And you know, it, it also builds on the Exodus events itself. The Pharaoh is always identifying his catastrophe with this God, Yahweh. And that's, there's not a land, there's a people, yes, but it's the Lord, Yahweh, who brings about judgment upon the Pharaoh. Folks, we hope you're enjoying this awesome conversation we're having about this incredible inscription. Uh, we'll be right back in a few moments to finish up our show with Mr. Joel Kramer. Don't go away. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence properly interpreted upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. Today I've been joined by a friend, and colleague in ministry, archaeologist Mr. Joel Kramer with SourceFlix Ministries all the way from Amman, Jordan. Today we've been talking about the Soleb inscription and how it mentions the God Yahweh, uh, the people of Israel as nomads, and uh, it's very early and a very significant discovery. Joel, um, thank you so much for sharing all, all of that about this awesome inscription. I think, I think people really need to know about it. I think it vindicates uh, our view of the scriptures and really goes against all of these sort of unbelieving theories about the development of the Bible and the history of the people of Israel. But what I'd like to do is turn here a little bit and talk about, well, how did you go and study this inscription? How did you find, you found out about it through Redford, who we quoted earlier, but tell the audience about this excursion that you went on. It's really, it's really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, uh, when I started researching the uh, inscription for myself, I found uh, very little information about it. And, uh, and so it became important for me in order to understand these inscriptions better to actually go to the Sudan. And it's a problem if you're living in Israel to travel to the Sudan. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyways, I was able to uh, go there. I was able to find a driver with a four-wheel drive vehicle because it was both on and off-road. And I spent uh, a couple of weeks traveling in the Sudan and across the Sahara Desert, going through many, many checkpoints and sleeping on the ground. And uh, anyways, it was quite a, a trip and not a very comfortable trip. But I, I spent uh, over five days at the Solab Temple, photographing every inch of it and, and just really studying it. And, uh, and so for me personally, that's why I moved over to Israel and now Jordan is... For me, really, to understand something, I got to go there. I got to see it. I got to uh, put it in its context, and so that was really what was behind the trip to Sudan. 
Yeah, that's 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 tremendous. And of course, the Lord was with you uh, uh, definitively. Uh, Sudan is a is a, there's some instability there politically, and it's a predominantly Muslim country. So uh, you know, uh, uh, you were coming from Israel, so that that the, the, your sense of adventure is there. I admire you, uh, but but uh, <laughs> of course, the Lord is uh, protecting you through all that too. Uh, quite quite a, an experience, huh? Yes, it was absolutely, but but definitely worth it too. And uh, it was a little disappointing at the Amara West site I've been talking about how they reburied that temple. So you can't really see the inscriptions there. The good thing is, is those inscriptions are protected because they were reburied after excavations. But at Solab, you can see all the inscriptions, including this one that we're talking about. Yeah, that, that's excellent. As we have the show uh, going on, we'll be showing photographs of the, of the inscriptions so people can see. So let, let's talk a little bit, Joel. Uh, you you did this wonderful video about this inscription, and we're gonna we're gonna give that information to our audience so they could go watch it. Uh, one of the things that you did in there uh, in the video was I thought was really tremendous, and I'd like you to talk about this. Uh, we're talking about archaeology, of course, the Bible, the reliability of the scriptures, but the but but what we want to do is point people to the God who reveals Himself in the scriptures. And in that video, you talk about the name Yahweh and his enduring nature. And maybe, maybe you could just take it from there and just sort of build upon, upon that and go and tell our audience a little bit about that. Well, the, the key is Exodus 3, where Moses asks God for his name. And uh, of course, he says, I am who I am. And that has more to do with what God's name means. But his name is Yahweh. And uh, yes. so... He's given his name Yahweh, and then it says in uh, Exodus 3.15, it says, uh, God says, this is my name forever, the name that I shall be called from generation to generation. And so that gives a time element. That means that God is going to be called by the name Yahweh through all generations and through history. And so really the question is, is, is there archaeological evidence for that, that, that God has been called by the name Yahweh from, uh, from this time, Exodus 3, on down until today? And the answer is clearly yes, because of these many, many uh, inscriptions that have been found. You mentioned, uh, we mentioned two, one from about 1400 B.C. at uh, Solab, one from Amara West, about 1300 B.C. You mentioned uh, the Moabite stone, which is uh, the 9th century B.C. that mentions the name Yahweh. We have the silver amulets from Jerusalem, 6th century B.C., and uh, the Lachish letters, and I could go on and on and on, Yes, uh, down to the Dead Sea Scrolls that mention the name Yahweh over and over again. So we have all these archaeological finds from all these inscriptions that cover from generation to generation, proving that God has indeed been known and called by the name Yahweh down through time. This is very much in contrast to the nation, to the gods of the other nations who right. have disappeared over time. Where do people get together and worship Moloch, the, the god of Canaan? Where do they get together and worship yeah. the gods of the Philistines or the Ammonites or the Moabites or the Edomites? They, they're, they're all gone. They've all disappeared through history because the people who believe in them have become extinct and with them their belief in these false gods, whereas... The reason that there are still people, including ourselves, that worship Yahweh today in the world is because he's real. He's able to save his people again and again. And so uh, that time element is key yeah. uh, in understanding what is true and what is false. And uh, the true God uh, is obvious when you uh, give it the test of time like that. Yeah, th a, a description is 3,400 and some odd years old. And here we are proclaiming his name Today, now we find his name in the name of Jesus, right? Yeshua. Absolutely. Is Yahweh, Absolutely. Yahweh saves, right? Uh, Absolutely, and, yes. And, and, and Jesus declaring himself to be uh, the very God revealed in the Old Testament. Joel, we've got about 30 seconds to uh, finish up. What, would, what was the final thing you'd like to say about, uh, about this, this description and in, in the name Yahweh being found in there? Well, it's, it's really, as you pointed out, it's really not about the archaeology itself. It's archaeology. The archaeology is just, um, it's just one of the things that show how awesome the God that we worship is and how enduring he is 
and how real his salvation is. Yes. And so it's just, uh, it's, it, it's beyond our comprehension. It is. Uh, just as his creation is. And so we just, uh, it's one of those things to celebrate and to marvel uh, how his realness has left all this evidence behind that, um, that we can now use to try to persuade others to believe in him. Amen to that. Joel, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, friends, for joining us. We pray that you will turn your heart to Yahweh, Jesus who saves. Have a great day.